we have sound. Um, thank you all for coming to, because this is the, the last panel, one of the last panels of the day. Thank you all very much for coming. It's a little weird to have all the lights on. It's like very, it's kind of like, you know, at the, like at the prom or whatever, when they turn the lights on, you know? Anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Jamin Warren. I am the proprietor of a video game arts and culture company called Kill Screen. Um, so I had a, um, so I had a conversation uh, earlier this year with our people organizers, Christina, and we were talking about games, and specifically we were curious about like, how do games kind of fit into meme culture outside of you know, putting solid sync in humorous positions and posting it on the internet. So, um, you know, so uh, Kill Screen is a video game arts and culture company. We publish a magazine, we run a website, and we're really interested in this big question of what does it mean for people play games. And so I was thinking more deeply about like, you know, games as they fit into meme culture. And one of the things that Christine and I were talking about is this idea of like difficulty, right? That we all play games um, in different shapes or fashions. And at some level, I guess, we'd like to be challenged. But there's this sort of magical line where you can be challenged too much. Um, about a year ago, um, I did a talk at the Game Developers Conference. Um, it was a micro talk, it was one of those speedy 10 minute uh, Kachikusha kind of things. And one of the speakers there was a game designer named Jason Rohr. And this is one of the things that he had to say. So, um, so he was making this argument about like, what's so special about games? Uh, what makes games different from you know, other forms of media? You spend seven seconds in front of a painting, uh, maybe an hour and a half watching a movie, but you play hours and hours and hours of games. And his worry was that a lot of the younger independent game designers were getting rid of challenge, right? So they're making these kind of arty games, and one of his passage is not a quote unquote difficult game. So where does difficulty sort of leave the game designer? And so he's asking this big question of like, how does difficulty fit into like, how we think about contemporary games? So that got me thinking about like my experiences playing really difficult games. Um, one of which is this game called um, Space Ace. Has anybody played this game before? It's uh, one of the few Don Bluth, uh, it was a laser disc game. So uh, it was full of these quick time sequences. It is impossible to play, utterly impossible to play. In fact, so I, I bought this one and another one called uh, Mad Dog McCree, uh, which is another like, gun classic. So I bought these for my, for my iPod, and I estimated it must have been somewhere between $75 and $100 that I would have had to spend to actually beat this game. Like, this game's a light gun game, and you shoot at people. Like, and this is also what the screen looks like right before you die, because there's like a gun in the window or something. So, so where does this kind of like lead games? How should we think about games? These incredibly, incredibly difficult games. How do they fit in? How should we make sense of them when they are like, you know, basically trolling you to death? So I have an esteemed panel of people of way I think understand uh, how difficult games work and how to make them. Um, we have Michael Kane O'Reilly of Hello oh, everyone. Uh, we have Bennett Foddy of Clock and Dirt, and yes, for you of the NYU Game Center. And with that, I will turn it over to Bennett. There you go, pass the mic, or the clicker, I guess. Uh, all right, my name's uh, Bennett Foddy, and uh, my day job is that I'm a philosopher at Oxford University. Um, and by night, I make uh, indie video games. And I'm best known for this uh, video game called Quag, the... Uh, uh, <laughs> All right, so what looks like that? It's, it's, a, uh, it's a free flash game that's on my website, foddy.net, and it's been played, I guess, um, I don't have really good statistics anymore, but it's been played around about uh, 100 million times. Um, <laughs> seriously, that's about all um, So I guess most of you have played it, um, uh, but just in case you haven't, I was told to kind of introduce it and say what it was. So here is a video showing how it works. What's up, everybody? It's critical. Most difficult game I've ever played in my life is called Kiwa. I'm commentating this while I'm playing. I'm struggling to get my character to take the proper running stance. But uh, what it is is you are an Olympic runner by some incredible feat. Uh, apparently, this guy has no bones or cartilage, and he must somehow control this weird ass to uh, a 100-meter finish line. So, yep, Owen he moved the calves while Q&W moved the dots. And it is fucking impossible. <laughs> I slowed you down here a little bit, but uh... Alright, so... Yes? So that is just like one uh, out of a very large 
large number of YouTube videos uh, for, for Quok. Uh, people have made these videos of themselves uh, playing the game. There are some uh, videos where they've done things like inserted themselves in the game or they've inserted uh, anime schoolgirls in the game. <laughs> but most of them are about people playing themselves and they, they do that, I think, for two reasons. The first one is it's kind of funny to watch people playing and that's, that's a really super important aspect of the game. Uh, but the second reason is that people think that it's really hard and they want to prove to other people that they can do it. So YouTube has become like the high score table for uh, Quok. Uh, so there's a handful of videos of people playing the game uh, really well, right, like this one. Wow. Um, but most of, them, most of them don't look like that. Most of them look like this. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's super famous for being a hard game. People often call it the hardest game, I think it's quite unreasonable. It's so famous for being hard that you get videos that are like this. to the big race. Uh, you the gun shot and you just keep going. Uh, you ignore all the numbers on the number pad. Uh, what your fingers are doing in the race doesn't really matter. <laughs> Focus the most on your legs and your arms. Uh, also, don't forget to keep hitting space bar pretty frequently. It makes you sweat and you don't want to overheat. <laughs> also, B makes your guy breathe, so you know, keep hitting that. And we're getting a little tipped over here, so just you know, pump your shoulders and elbows until you can keep your balance back. And there we go. Um, okay, you know, hit space bar a few times, you know, let it sweat out, and B obviously to make your guy breathe. And another thing you remember uh, when you're running is you don't want your legs to move too quickly uh, rub against each other that much. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, make sure you're not too quick with your thighs or you'll get a boner and you'll fall. <laughs> <laughs> right, look, I don't think Quok's actually that hard, right? I mean, <laughs> I think we'll play it for a while, uh, you know, they wind up making some progress, maybe they'll get sort of uh, halfway through, maybe a quarter of the way through, which is a lot better than people do with things like Space Invaders and Galaga and Pac-Man, right? So I don't think it's particularly hard, but it's abusive in this particular way. So when you've struggled to 50 meters, you've been kind of uh, scooting along the ground, suddenly there's a hurdle. <laughs> when you get right to the end, you drag yourself to 100 meters, there's this jump sign, and you're expected to kind of jump as far as you can into a sand pit. Uh, so, that is kind of like the mentality that I brought to this game. I think that creates the impression that it's hard. Uh, so my other well-known game is called uh, Gurp. It's about climbing a uh, cliff by pressing uh, the letters on the keyboard. That's how it looks when someone's playing it pretty well. Uh, and I think this is also a pretty easy game, but it has the same attitude which I call Fuck you, player one. <laughs> uh, so this guy has gotten right to the top, and his goal is to get the prize at the top of the cliff. Like that's the, the final goal, and he's he's frozen it to make a, a YouTube video of him beating the game. Here's the end of the curve. All I gotta do is grab the present, and we'll be done. Oh my gosh, that bird can land on the present. What? <laughs> I guess Kagan's going to go into his hate mail in more detail, but I thought I'd just show a couple. So this guy, 
uh, has been dying inside for the last hour. And you notice they always sort of indicate that they've been playing for a really long time, and that's part of why they've decided to send you some hate mail. <laughs> Uh, normally they're quite nice like that, sometimes you get ones, this is another actual email. Uh, right. I haven't edited that down, in fact you can only see about a quarter of it here. <laughs> and I love this stuff, right, I mean this is, this is for me, this is gold. Um, so, I'll try to give you a, just an idea of how I see this. I don't think there are any uh, single player games. I think there are multiplayer games where you play uh, as one player, you're doing battle against another player. And I think there are multiplayer games where you do, where the player does battle with the game developer, right? And so when you send me an email like this, it tells me that I won, that I beat. <laughs> 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 right. With that, I'm going to pass it on. Hi, I'm Michael Kane O'Reilly. Um, I made. I want to be the guy. Well, I don't have any wonderful videos or anything like that. Either because I couldn't get any internet. But um, I do have uh, some other things, like lots of hate mail. But first, uh, the premise in lieu of any videos. Um, oh man, how am I going to read this? <laughs> you can all just read that. That wasn't written by me. I, um, I crowdsourced that to my form, because writing is harder than making a really hard game. OK. So let's get the hate mail. I did it. I beat your game. I spent so long. You wasted so much of my life. Fuck you. <laughs> I hate you. This is me, obviously. I loathe you. You're an awful, awful uh, person for bringing this game into the world. I had a life. I had friends. I had dreams. And now all, all I have is this ever-increasing rage and frustration inside me because of you. I just have to beat this awful creation. And I am only met with frustration and failure. <laughs> May you burn in a special circle of hell for making this soul-sucking abomination upon the Lord. Prick. <laughs> You fucking game has kept me hooked all night. I hate you. Much love. Nashi? I am playing your game. Fuck you, motherfucker. I am fucking your mother while I am lying in the game. I seriously fuck you, your developer guy. Smiley face. Macaberto, do I even need to say why I am sending this message? Why is he, she, it's such a bitch to kill? What were you thinking? <laughs> um, and this is one of my um, favorite replies to people. Generally, I'm very, um, I'm very, I talk to people a lot, but sometimes where it's just not worth it. I just want to rub their face in a little bit more. <laughs> but surprisingly, um, despite making a really, really hard game, this isn't actually the general response. I actually had to labor pretty hard to find all these examples, mostly going through my Gmail, looking up fuck and hate and shit and various curse words. Uh, generally, my email uh, box looks more like this. And it is really mostly fan mail. And it's only a very tiny, tiny fraction is hate mail. There, there is just this um, this group of players who, like, as soon as they get like one or two bosses in, they're like, they're brought back to being 12 with their NDS. And they really appreciate it. And almost every email I get is from somebody um, generally relatively old in their late 20s saying, just thanking me for making the first game they've enjoyed in forever. Um, though that said, yeah, I can get lots of cat pictures of my people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, let's turn over to the who's going to give us the um, obligatory academic, um, what does this all mean? Kind of talk. Or yeah, package. I guess, I guess <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm yes, you had at the I'm working at the MIU Game Center. So um, I like to be talking about some <coughs> embarrassing aspects of my personality and I'm hoping to mitigate that uh, embarrassment by adding some theory. So that's what theory is is what I meant to be for, if you don't know what that's it. Uh, so David asked me to talk about how I came to be interested in difficult games. 
And I think it's on the start that I realized that I'm sort of fundamentally a, a soul loser. <laughs> and, and I'm actually such a soul loser that I didn't realize it for a very long time. So uh, I, I, I came to think of that when I was around 10, I was playing for a very long time playing table tennis with a, with a friend. And I, I actually think I lost almost every single game. But I also, I also I realized that I never actually felt bad about it because I could always come up with some reason why I hadn't won the game. Right? So, you know, it's like there was something I wasn't trying or I was being distracted by something. There was always this kind of so amazing reason for why, why it was my own fault. So I was such a soul loser that I couldn't even um, accept responsibility. And, uh, but why are we even talking about this? Uh, I mean, I think it's true that that's something that that's something that it feels good to sort of win or, or feel accomplishment. But perhaps this is even fun at times. You know, it's right. But this is not really what I'm talking about. I've come to sort of think that video games, in a way, are fundamentally about failing rather than winning. So uh, it's a bit of a truism that games aren't simply fun. But I do think that most of the time when we play games, and especially games play and when we're not, we don't look that happy, right? That's just the way that's right. <laughs> we're tense, we're frustrated, we're angry, we're disturbed. But I think games are in a way like fundamentally about failure because failure is what connects us to a game. Failure is what makes us realize that we are flawed as, as players, as people. And, players, and failure is what makes us put in effort in order to escape that feeling of, of feeling bad and being, of being flawed. So failure is this kind of moment of so think about this like if you if you played a game like Portal 2 or Portal 3 or Portal. Um, so when we're stuck in a game like this, we realize that we're sort of lagging and inadequate. And the, the longer we're stuck, the more time we put into playing, the more inadequate and lagging we are. Uh, and of course, then, then it's this kind of funny thing. It's not that, I mean, before Portal, before you played Portal, you probably didn't consider this possibility that you were a kind of person who had problems with puzzles involving walls. Because it's like us, like me, puzzles and modeling works probably didn't, I mean, didn't really exist on a major scale. So, so Portal has created this kind of an artificial test, and suddenly it's created this kind of feeling of being flawed in you. It demonstrates that you can't do this thing that just didn't exist before. So, uh, but of course, at the same time, the game sort of promises us that we can fix the problem if we keep playing, right? Uh, and I think this is what, what games tend to do. They promise us that we can repair a kind of personal inadequacy but it's an inadequacy that they sort of created in the first place. Um, and I think so you say like what was sort of interesting about, about uh, the two games we're discussing here is that in a way they're sort of, you might say they're interesting because they sort of seem to break that sort of promise to some extent. Um, so you say the games are really designed to feel, make us feel bad. Um, and so this is, uh, this is actually sort of like a, a kind of somewhat traditional aesthetic question, if you will. So there's a lot of discussion historically about tragedy and things like horror, so which do seem to have this kind of weird quality to them that, that generally speaking, we don't like to sort of be sad or cry or we don't like to be scared, but it, there, there's something <coughs> weird about uh, sort of various art forms that, that where we seem, seem to seek out emotions that we regularly avoid. And I think games are definitely like part of that. Like, I mean, why would you choose to subject yourself to, to or I want to be that guy. Like, it doesn't actually make any sense. 